although Professor Hales doesn't need an introduction, of course, and my introduction is going to be very short because we're all looking forward to listening to her, not me. <laughs> Um, Professor Hales has been writing consistently on the intersection of these fields since the 1980s, and among her dozens of books, a dozen books, of course, we have um, 1999, How We Became Posthuman, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature and Informa Informatics, which won the um, Rene Wellick Prize for Best Book in Literary Theory, and is of course famous for introducing a theory of the post-human that accounts for both the being and the, recon the reconceptualization it leads to. Professor Hales pursued her exploration of technology and literature with writing machines, which won the Suzanne Langer Award for Outstanding Scholarship, and most recently, uh, post-print, books and becoming computational, uh, which has been or is being published in spring 2021 by Columbia University Press. And of course, many of them, uh, many, many other books in between these two. As a literary scholar, I particularly enjoy Professor Hales's work because she engages on literature as rigorously as she does on science and technology. Being for me an actual exemplary figure of the transit transdisciplinary nature so dear, sorry, the transdisciplinarity so dear to both scholarships of my nieces and the posthuman. One of her latest books, Unthought, The Power of the Cognitive Non-Conscious, published at the University of Chicago Press in 2017, represents a contribution to both my nieces and the posthuman, thus reinforcing and making even more apparent the connection between these two. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of listening to Professor Hale several times, not because I've been stalking her, but rather because Professor Hales is just as brilliant as she is generous, accepting enthusiastic, enthusiastically invitations from both senior and junior scholars. And I thought this also needed to be acknowledged. And as I have the floor, I wanted to warmly thank her for both her exceptional contribution to the field and her general availability and her support. We might not have been here if it wasn't for her, and at least I know I wouldn't be. So thank you, dear Catherine. The floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Guess, and it gives me particular pleasure to use your title since I was on your dissertation committee. And I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Latou, both for the invitation to be here and for sharing some of his work with me before the conference. I'm really excited uh, to be sharing some thoughts with you today because I was looking over the book of abstracts and there are so many fascinating talks. And uh, in addition, I saw so many connections with the thoughts that I'll be sharing with you today. So I hope perhaps we might have an opportunity to explore some of those in the question and answer period following my talk. So now I'll share my screen and bring up my PowerPoint. Uh, when that's done, I'll reappear and uh, perhaps then we can have some interesting dialogue and intriguing exchanges. Okay, so we begin now. Can you see my screen? Uh, you see the PowerPoint? Okay, very good. Uh, just, just be careful not to go um, too near to your microphone because otherwise there is a small, you know, textile style, but, uh, textile sound, but I think now it's okay. okay. Oh, wait, I don't know. A long history of the mimesis concept, one generalization holds true. Mimesis has almost always been applied to human art forms. However, if non human organisms can engage in meaning making practices, as biosemioticians have convincingly declared, then it may be useful to consider what mimesis might signify in the non human realm. Recently, I suggested a framework in which such issues might be considered. 
in unthought, in unthought, the power of the cognitive non-conscious, I argued that cognition should be understood as a process that extends beyond humans, beyond even mammals, to all biological life forms, as well as computational systems. I defined it as, quote, a process that interprets information within contexts that connect it with meaning. This definition opens a wide-ranging reconsideration of non-human mimetic practices. Mimesis has long been understood not as mere copying, but as selective representation of aspects of nature. Selection and recontextualization incorporate into the concept the width of the artist, the scent of creativity that makes a mimetic recreation different from the original. Moreover, since Aristotle, mimesis has also been associated with both distance and empathy, the former catalyzing and empowering the latter as viewers partly insulated from personal threats by the differences are unable to recognize similarities between themselves and the represented others, thus facilitating identification and catharsis. How might the dynamics characteristic of mimesis change when the organisms are non-human? How are the borders between copying and representing negotiated when the media are not art forms, but organismic responses? What purposes would mimesis processes serve and what functions would they enable if the organisms engaging them were not conscious? What if the stakes in mimetic recreation are not only an individual's fate, but the collective and perhaps even the species? This talk and this talk explores these and other questions by investigating the technological capture of the non-cognitive, non-conscious cognitive processes of bacteria defending themselves against viral attacks. The bacterial responses show how the mimetic processes of the non-human realm can be modified and manipulated to serve human purposes, including producing post-human bodies. Mimesis is not only about art, but about fundamental strategies of survival for human and non-human alike. Biologists have known for some time that when viruses attack a bacteria colony, some bacteria are likely to survive and develop immunity. Only within the last few decades, however, have the mechanisms involved been revealed. The discovery began with the recognition that the DNA of such microorganisms as Haloferrex mediterranei, which live in salt pools where the salinity is 10 times that of the ocean, consisted of repeating small fragments that were the same interspersed with spacers that had different configurations. Francisco Mejica, a microbiologist at the University of Alicante in Spain, explains the acronym CRISPR, Clustered Regularly Interspace Palindromic Repeats, to describe the phenomenon. This discovery was coupled with the realization that while the CRISPR clusters were identical, consisting of the same fragments of DNA, the space proportions were highly variable as well as different from the repeating clusters. Mojica and other researchers then realized that the spacer sections were copied from the DNA of attacking viruses. Serving as the cell's memory of such an event, a spacer's information was transferred via RNA to an enzyme, Cas9, that had the ability to cleave nucleotide sequences, that is, to act as a nuclease. And here you see this process illustrated, the virus invading the cell, uh, part of its DNA captured in a spacer. That spacer is used to form a CRISPR RNA, and then with Cas9, it's able to cut the viral uh, DNA. Serving as the cell's memory of the event, a spacer's information was transferred VNA, via RNA to an enzyme that had the ability to cleave nucleotide sequences. 
When it found a match in the information it carried, it severed the corresponding viral DNA, thus effectively killing the virus. So clever, Mojica remarked of the strategy, quickly adding that, of course, it came about not through any conscious thought, but through evolution. This strategy exemplifies what I call microbiomimesis. It fulfills the traditional requisites for a mimetic act. It represents something found in nature, the virus DNA, but does not merely copy it. The recreated DNA fragment is different from the original because it has been recontextualized in and incorporated into the bacterium's DNA. Moreover, there it performs a completely different function than in the original. It now operates not to replicate the virus, but rather is used to counterattack and kill the virus instead. Seen from the perspective of human actions, the high stakes of this drama are worthy of a Greek tragedy, being nothing less than life and death. For the bacteria, of course, the action is guided not by conscious thought, but by eons of evolutionary history in which a species has developed this adaptive mechanism through mutation and natural selection. The affective responses of humans to this microbial battle should rightly be understood as a projection without basis in what the bacteria themselves experience. The microbiomimetic drama intersected with human acts and intentions, however, when researchers realized its significance for human-initiated gene editing. Several seminal papers co-authored by Emmanuel Charpartier and Jennifer Doudna and their collaborators made the connection between Cas9 cutting the DNA of viruses and its potential for gene editing work subsequently recognized when they were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Calling Cas9 a, quote, programmable nuclease, they created an all-purpose gene editing tool by fusing the RNA fragment that recognized the viral DNA with the RNA that matches it to a gene that is transactivating CRISPR RNA or tracer RNA thus creating guide RNAs that direct Cas9 to a specific DNA sequence to cut. They further pointed out that the mechanism could be used for any gene, not simply viral DNA. The concluding sentence of their immortal paper made the point clear, quote, we propose an alternative methodology based on RNA program Cas9 that could offer considerable potential for gene editing and gene targeting applications. Additional research showed that the cutting could be accompanied by another process that inserted a new DNA sequence at the site of the cut. When a cell encounters a disruption in a DNA sequence, something that happens often during normal cell division, the cell will try to splice the two ends together. Dudna and Samuel Sternberg point out the, quote, inherent sloppiness, unquote, of this process because the nucleotide sequences may lose a few bases to create the correct pair joining, that is A with T, G with C. By contrast, if the guide RNA offers the cell a template that exactly matches the two cut ends, the cell will preferentially use that instead. This means not only can specific sites in RNA be targeted for cuts, but that repairs can also be made to correct disease-causing mutations. Other procedures have expanded the uh, CRISPR's functionality so that it now enables an entire suite of gene editing processes including deletion, addition, insertion, rearrangement, knockout, which disables a gene's ability to code for a protein, and knock in. The huge advantage of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing are its precision, efficiency, and relatively cheap cost, in part because CRISPR relies on DNA-RNA pairings rather than other approaches 
that synthetically engineer proteins to bind to specific DNA sequences. While modifying a single gene with zinc finger nuclease, which is an older gene editing technique, cost $25,000 for a single gene, CRISPR can replace several genes at once for a few hundred dollars or less. It is now possible to submit R online the RNA of the gene to be edited, and a laboratory will create CRISPR RNAs targeted to that gene and ship them out in a few days. The result has been to open gene editing to a large variety of organisms, including dogs, pigs, mice, butterflies, mosquitoes, and other animals. Plants have also been treated with a large variety of gene edits designed to increase yields, make them more resistant to diseases, and more tolerant of climate changes. CRISPR gene editing has also been used with humans to cure sickle cell anemia, beta, thalassemia, that's a blood disorder that reduces the oxygen level in cells, inherited blindness, and even some types of cancer. There are several areas of controversy with gene editing techniques. First is the concern that gene editing on wild type animals and plants may get out of control and result in unintended consequences or alternatively be used to eradicate some species altogether. These concerns have been catalyzed by the development of gene drives, techniques to spin, spread mutations rapidly in a population. One such technique used CRISPR to inject an organism with the CRISPR sequence itself, thus giving the organism a recursively doubled mutation ability. Ethan Beyer and his student Valentino Gatz at the University of California, San Diego, used the technique in 2015 with fruit flies, editing a gene that determines colored so that the mutated flies were yellow rather than the usual brown. The technique was so successful that they estimate if a single mutated fly had escaped the laboratory, it would have spread the yellow color to between 20 and 50% of all fruit flies worldwide. The technique has also been used with mosquitoes to give them resistance to the parasite that causes malaria. Other researchers have used gene drives to spread genes to cause female sterility in mosquitoes. Since the affected gene is recessive, the mutation would spread without apparent consequence until enough females carried two copies of the recessive gene, whereupon the population would suddenly crash. While making malaria causing mosquitoes extinct might be cause for celebration for the millions afflicted with the disease, a concern is that the technique could be extended to other species, including humans. Another looming problem is the availability of CRISPR amateur gene editing technique kits to anyone who has 100 bucks or so. Although the kits are designed for gene editing in bacteria and yeast, the potential for biohacking makes making them apply to other organisms is unknown. Given the ingenuity shown by hackers with computer code, what mischief they might do with the genetic code is cause for real concern. In light of these considerations, it's not difficult to see why in the 2016 Worldwide Threat Assessment Report by US intelligence agencies to the Senate Armed Services Committee, they identified under the biological warfare section, the quote, biological materials and technologies almost always dual use that move easily in a globalized economy as do personnel with the scientific expertise to design and use them. The tip off that they had CRISPR gene editing in mind is the phrase dual use, which connotes the potential for benefit as well as devastation. Conventional biological weapons have no such beneficial effects. Perhaps the most intense controversy concerning editing the human genome, especially germline editing, in which changes will be inherited by all subsequent individuals coming from that genetic line. While editing an individual's genome in somatic cells to correct single gene 
inherited diseases such as sickle cell anemia has already been done and is largely considered to be ethically acceptable, many researchers have argued for a moratorium on germline editing. The risks are clearly laid out in an article by Edward Lampier and colleagues, don't edit the human germline. Editing, addressing its use in, in human embryos, the authors explain, quote, it would be difficult to control exactly how many cells are modified. Increasing the dose of nu nuclease used would increase the likelihood that the mutated genes would be corrected, but also raise the risk of cuts being made elsewhere in the genome. Moreover, there are also possibilities that only one copy of the double helix target gene would be modified, or that the cell could start dividing before the corrections were complete, resulting in a genetic mosaic. Consequently, quote, the precise effects of genetic modification to an embryo may be impossible to know until after birth or even several years later. A case in point is published in the Protein and Cell Journal by GGU Huyang's lab in Sun Yat-sen University in China. They used CRISPR with 86 human embryos to edit the gene that produces beta globin, intending to demonstrate that it was possible by this means to cure the blood disease beta thethylsemia caused by a defect in this gene. Of the 86 embryos, only four were successfully mutated. Other embryos had their gene sequences edited at off-target sites, resulting in haphazard mutations other than the one intended. In addition, several embryos were converted into genetic uh, mosaics, just as Lampier and his colleagues feared, because the CRISPR intervention, intervention took place after the cells had started dividing. In this research program, all the embryos were non-viable and would never mature into human persons, but the results clearly showed the potential for disastrous outcomes if the CRISPR editing was not done with scrupulous care. Not everyone agrees that germline editing is a mistake. On the other side of the issue, the bioethicist Julian Savalescu and colleagues in 2015 published an article also in Protein and Cell, arguing that it's a moral imperative to continue human germline editing. They pointed out that about 6% of all children born worldwide have serious birth defects arising from genetic causes. Making gene editing available for them would benefit about 8 million children per year. Indeed, close reading of Lamphere's article reveals a rather large gap between the abstract concepts they espouse and real human suffering. It's one thing to argue as they do that germline editing is unnecessary because editing somatic cells can accomplish the same goals without the risks. Imagine, however, making that argument to someone who is suffering life-destroying levels of pain because he has sickle cell anemia. He and his wife want to have a child. They want to have the embryo edited in vitro to correct the gene that causes the disease, thus freeing the baby and all the baby's subsequent progeny from the disease. Telling them to wait until the baby is born and then when the child is old enough to have an operation, doing gene editing on the somatic cells would mean to them condemning their child to the same racking pains the father has endured. Moreover, he would be acutely aware of the cellular damage that the disease causes. Why wait until the disease has already started and has caused intense suffering when germline editing could eliminate it relatively easily when only a few cells instead of millions would need to be modified? More conundrums arise if or rather when CRISPR techniques are used for human enhancement, that is editing genes controlling traits such as height, eye and hair color, endurance, musculature, need for sleep, or even more complex multi-gene inheritance such as intelligence, creativity, or flexibility. 
Further complicating the issue is the fact that the line between correction and enhancement is far from clear cut. Already in use are techniques in which a couple uses their eggs to create a number of embryos and then employs genetic testing to choose among them a technique called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. What if in addition for screening for heritable diseases, they are also choosing for sex and other attributes? These kinds of concerns already present with older gene, gene editing techniques have been greatly exacerbated by the accessibility, ease and use and economics of CRISPR. They go far beyond the boundaries of scientific research into questions about ethics, social justice, economic inequality, and the futures of humans and non-humans. Microbiomimesis thus intersects with macro concerns that have traditionally been the province of the humanities and the interpretive social sciences. What insights might these traditions, including the concept of mimesis, bring to the table? To address this issue, we can start by distinguishing between a tool, as gene editing mechanisms are often called, and the cognitive acts of bacteria. Traditionally, a tool is considered to be without its own agency. A hammer, for example, needs a person to activate it and decide what object to hit. By contrast, the bacteria in Cas9 are interpreting information from their environments and proceeding according to their own agency, attributes that in my definition make them cognitive. Within their context, their actions are meaning-making practices with meaning understood as in biosemiotics, not as an abstract concept, but as an adaptive response to an environmental signal. To make this argument, biosemioticians employ a Persian triadic semiotics in which an interpretant intervenes between the sign vehicle and object to connect the two. For non-human species without consciousness, the interpretant is understood as an embodied action contextualized by the interpretive capacities and sensoria of an organism. As Wendy Wheeler put it, quote, meanings are the result of a process of discovery and interpretation. Life is process and all organisms must be capable of change in response to changing conditions, unquote. In this view, meaning is created when an organism interprets an environmental signal and consequently performs actions that have consequences for the organism. Seen in this light, CRISPR gene editing mechanisms represent a technosymbiosis between the cognitions of conscious humans and the non-conscious co cognitions of bacteria to accomplish something that neither party could by itself. And I'll just emphasize that neither party could accomplish this by itself. It needs a collaboration. Both create and rely upon semiosis. Humans through verbal and symbolic language such as English and mathematics and bacteria through actions that function as interpretants joining the sign vehicle, in this case, mimetic recognition of DNA with the object cutting the DNA at the appropriate site. What are the implications of considering gene editing as not as a clever tool invented by humans, but as a collaboration between human conscious cognition and bacterial non-conscious cognition with both partners relying on the generation and interpretation of signs? Such a shift opens on to much broader and deeper issues about the human place in the ecosphere of life on Earth. Given our multiple anthropogenic environmental crises, combating anthrop anthropocentrism and the belief that humans have the right to dominate all other species becomes an urgent task. Recognizing the cognitive capacities of bacteria and other non-human life forms is a step in the right direction. So is the realization that non-human life forms create, transmit, and interpret signs always in embodied contexts that connect their interpretations to meanings as it exists for them. This view powerfully counteracts the pow mistaken belief that only humans and perhaps a few other mammals are capable of meaning making 
opening the entire biosphere, non-conscious as well as conscious, to intersecting, overlapping, reinforcing, and contesting realms of meaning. One of the traditional functions of mimesis has been to facilitate social cohesion by representing others different from oneself in ways that ident ident invite identification and understanding. Microbiomimesis serves to protect the individual bacterium and community from predatory outsiders that would kill the colony. In this sense, it represents an action very familiar in human dramas. Perhaps no other theme stretching across millennia from the Iliad to Independence Day, the movie, is so pervasive that microbiomimesis can now be technically captured and made into a mechanism to alter the genomes of humans and non-human organisms bestows an awesome power godlike in scope and significance, for it can literally change the relation of humans to our species and to non-human organisms. If we focus only on the dual use of CRISPR technology, we may mis mistakenly decide that the technology itself is neutral. Such a view misses the much larger point that the technology is absolutely not neutral in its effects, for it radically transforms the dynamics of evolution to make it into a human-directed process. For the first time in human history, it bestows, quote, the unthinkable power to control evolution, which is the subtitle of Dudna's book. What wisdom can microbiomimesis offer to help us navigate these uncharted waters, both for our own species and for those with whom we share the planet? I think there are two large lessons that microbiomimesis can provide. One has already been touched upon, the need for caution and slow development accompanied by broad and deep conversations among scientists, bioethicists, legislatures, and citizens on how to proceed. Here we may emphasize the evolutionary history of microbiomimesis, which developed over millions of generations and when test was tested continuously in the context of changing and fluctuating environments. Only the most robust responses compatible with the environment and the complex requirements for survival could pass such tests. Gene editing, by contrast, can result in significant changes that take place suddenly and without extensive environmental testing. When applied to an individual organism, the consequences can possibly be anticipated accurately, for example, when gene editing is used to cure someone with sickle cell anemia. Even here, however, gene editing involves unknown risks for interactions between genes are not well understood. These risks apply also to gene editing of non-human organisms where the results may affect ecological interactions and result in disasters, unattended consequences. And this is especially true for interventions that are using accelerated gene drives to drive a mutation rapidly in the population. When the human germline is at issue, the risks are correspondingly greater and mitigate against introducing new modifications not already present in normal human genomes. This may mean proceeding with curative gene line editing, but drawing the line, however difficult to determine, between curing inherited diseases and introducing human enhancements. The second large lesson has to do with the able function of mimesis to facilitate identification and empathy. As practiced in Greek drama and in microbiomimesis, the range of the mimetic identification is relatively narrow, never reaching beyond the limits of one species. But the collaboration between humans and bacteria that resulted in CRISPR gene editing have radically changed that. The awesome power these collaborations create must be matched by a correspondingly intense responsibility, not only to members of our own species, but to every species with whom we seek to intervene. Moreover, the goal of CRISPR interventions must not only be to create profits for inter capitalist enterprises, 
but to increase the health, vitality, and robustness of all the species involved, non-human as well as human. After all, the bacteria never had the opportunity or the wherewithal to give informed consent for our use of them. We have simply appropriated their powers without adequately acknowledging their contributions as cognitive meaning-making life forms. We can begin to repay them by understanding microbiomimesis as an opportunity and an obligation to recognize our responsibility to them and to non-human species. The techno-capture of microbiomimetic actions suggests enlarge the scope of mimetic meeting far beyond its original limits of increasing empathy for other humans and protecting the human community. Now microbiomimesis invites, no, no, compels us to empathize with, conserve, and consider the value of all species. It is clear that we humans are the ones who must take responsibility for the results of these partnerships, for only we have the power to do so. The final lesson that microbiomimesis offers is what Donna Haraway calls responsibility, the necessity to take responsibility, acknowledge kinship, and feel humility in the face of the enormous complexity of the biosphere, which makes so startlingly clear the limits on the human ability to control consequences. Thank you. And I welcome an opportunity to have questions and comments from you. So I'll stop my screen share now. Thank you so much, Professor Hales, it was enlightening and it really illustrated how rigorous you are with both the science and the ethics. <laughs> um, I see Kevin Lagrander has a question, so go ahead, Kevin. Oh, please turn your microphone on. Thanks. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. It was my headset. Sorry, um, Kate. Really interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering about another factor um, that may be um, a downside of of CRISPR as well as other new tools used for enhancement. I worry about social justice, um, and I wonder if you might comment on that. Like, in other words some of these processes are very expensive and who's going to make sure that they're available to everybody, not just the rich? Yeah, indeed, that is a growing concern and it, it extends far beyond gene editing to things like organ replacement, uh, various life extension techniques and so forth. And we know that there has been a gradual increase in life expectancy over the last century. But we also know the benefits of this are uh, not equally spread throughout the globe. The average life expectancy now on the continent of Africa, I think, is something like 25 years. In the US, it's almost twice that. And so already, these disparities that you're speaking about are, um, are already manifesting themselves. And it certainly is going to be a function of how much wealth an individual, a region, or a country has. And those who are more wealthy are going to be able to avail themselves of these techniques, uh, while those who don't have the, that kind of wealth, the poorer countries and the poorer regions and individuals, are uh, not going to be, do, be able to do so. So <clears throat> that's another reason, I think, to, to really put the brakes on the idea of human enhancement through gene editing techniques. Things like organ replacement, uh, yes, those are very expensive, but um, they're also not never gonna be very widespread. Gene editing on embryos can be quite widespread because it's so cheap and so easily done. So uh, I think these are very legitimate uh, ethical concerns. And I think we have every reason to say, yes, um, 
find to cure inherited diseases. If we're talking about human en enhancement, we have to talk about that much more to be able to develop ethical guidelines for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Zaytan? Oh, your microphone too. <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, thank you, Carol. And uh, thanks, thank you, <clears throat> Professor Hills, for this wonderful, very important talk. Uh, my question is really about uh, uh, your earlier uh, ideas that was uh, uh, raised in your book, yet yeah, 2005 book, My Mother Was a Computer. And uh, today's uh, where you talk about um, computing, uh, problems of computing, as um, computing compl uh, complexity to complexity. In relation to uh, gene editing, uh, as uh, uh, from complexity to complexity, because uh, gene editing is really seems like science today imi imi imitating to uh, film editing. Uh, montage that has been uh, um, invented in the early 20th century. So that's uh, possible to think uh, in ethical um, aspect, in ethical terms, in uh, this um, um, comparing between film editing and, editing and gene editing. Well, thank you for your for your uh, comment and your uh, question. And I thank you also for mentioning my book, uh, My Mother Was a Computer. In the, my more recent work, I've continued uh, thinking about computational media as uh, cognitive devices, that is devices which can also interpret information and uh, perform actions that have meaning within their context. So it's, a, it's an often debated question, even in computer science, circles whether computers can understand meanings. Uh, and of course, the, the uh, classical example here is John Cyril's Chinese room, where he argues that no uh, computers have no understanding of the symbols. They simply perform calculations and come out with results. But that entire argument of Cyril's, to my mind, is uh, incredibly biased in a human-centric way, even to the point of having the man sit in the room, sit in for a computer CB, CPU. So if we look at the question, not from a human's point of view, but from a computer's point of view, a computer has a milieu, a computer has a cognitive architecture going all the way from the um, uh, hardwired programming up through all the different levels of code up to high level languages like C++ and Java and so forth. And as the computer becomes more complex in its operations, it begins to introduce possibilities that um, are determinate. Yes, all algorithms are determinate. But now there are procedures for introducing recursivity and randomness into algorithms. And those uh, possibilities make the results unpredictable as uh, in the training of recurrent neural nets, for example. And so it's becoming more and more the case, I think, that understanding cognition uh, can, that cognition is delinked from consciousness in that Consciousness is not necessary for cognition to occur. That's why I keep using the phrase non-conscious cognition. And this extends not only to all biological life forms, but to computational media. As far as I know, there are no conscious computational media, but if consciousness is not necessary for cognition to occur, then I think we have no problem saying that computational media are cognitive. And within the terms that I was laying out when I alluded to the biosemiotic arguments about meaning in non-human organisms, computers can also create, disseminate, and interpret meanings. 
And this is becoming more and more the case um, with deep learning algorithms, uh, com computational systems that are self-evolving and self-learning and so forth. So uh, in my framework, um, delinking cognition from consciousness not only allows cognition to apply to all biological life forms, but to computational media as well. And I would argue, yes, computers do understand and disseminate meanings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Philip Wolf, please go ahead. Philip? You are muted, Philip. Oh. Oh, I don't know if he's, is he here? Yes, Philip? I could see him speaking and he's muted. Oh, oh, oh yes. Sorry. Uh, um, no problem. Catherine, else you have um, partly answered my question, but I still want to go into that. Um, for me, interpretation is the ability to make a choice, to have alternatives and to decide upon alternatives at the spot. Um, if genes or bacteria respond um, in a mechanistic way to a certain stimulus or impulse, um, is there still interpretation? Yeah, you yeah I, I would argue uh, that there are interpretive capacities in all biological life forms. So to take the bacterium as an example, a bacterium receives information about its environment through the sensory capacities that it has, and it decides whether it's going to move toward a food source or move uh, alternately away from some kind of toxin. So it is making an interpretation. Now you use the word mechanistically there, which might imply that as some people I think would argue, even some biologists, that <clears throat> Uh, life forms that have minimal cognitive capacities, such as plants, for example, uh, respond only mechanistically to changing environments. That is that they don't really have a choice. They're hardwired through er their evolutionary history to perform exactly the same action. Uh, but that's been increasingly disproved even by plant biologists who have shown the remarkable capacity of roots of plants, for example, to respond to a large variety of changing conditions, even conditions it may never have encountered before. And so there's always in the response of biological life forms some degree of plasticity where an interpretation is made and just as you suggested, a selection or a choice is made between various alternatives um, and that it's never completely de deterministic in the sense that you can predict with absolute accuracy what's going to be the outcome of any given encounter of an organism with its environment. And one could make exactly the same argument about computational media. Well, aren't they completely deterministic devices? Yes, they're deterministic, but at the same time, they're unpredictable through various techniques that have been created in the last few decades, such as recursion, uh, pseudo randomness, and so forth. They can arrive at outcomes that are not at all predictable. And if you look at the way that a, a covolutional neural net, for example, interprets images, it's obvious that they're making a whole variety of interpretations about where, where are the edges of the object, what counts as an object, so on and so forth. And their labeling of the object face, a, you know, cup, a tree or whatever uh, is highly contingent and shot through, through literally hundreds of thousands of iterations 
with various kinds of interpretations. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would could have could say a lot about this, but uh, others' questions are. I think they are autopoetic systems that just respond according to their own uh, biological system, and they do not really interpret. They just do it the way they are biologically kind of determined. Yes, but. Uh, <laughs> But it's, I think it's also a matter of metaphoricity and how you, um, how you interpret interpretation, yes? Yes. Thank you I, very much. I, I agree with that. I agree that um, if you understand interpretation as making a choice or a selection, uh, then you go down one line of reasoning. If you have a different interpret, different meaning of interpretation, then you would I think, come up with other conclusions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Nidesh, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Kate, for, for this wonderful talk and for pushing us hard to go beyond anthropocentrism uh, in order to, to face up to the question of responsibility, indeed. Uh, I really appreciate the, your emphasis on the non-conscious in order to introduce this spectrum of continuities between the human and the non-human, technological and environmental. And uh, my question has to do with the fact that the unconscious has tended to be interpreted within a psychoanalytical framework, at least in the humanities in the 20th century. And since you give the example of Aristotle, which is also the starting point for Freud's cathartic method early on in uh, uh, his studies on hysteria. Uh, I was wondering if uh, this notion of identification and empathy, which you wrote in, 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 in Aristotle, uh, can have a starting point that is not tragic, where tragedy is not the paradigmatic aesthetic form on which you know, we are allowed to think about identification. That's one side of the question. And the other side would be the counterpart, the uh, effects of mimesis that are not cognitive. Uh, and that can lead to what you call also magical thinking in your book uh, and the dangers uh, of non-cognition, it might mean, it's specifically in human behavior with respect to the new technologies that seem to have a power to induce uh, an inability to think um, almost in the Arendtian sense. Well, uh, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm not sure I fully grasp all the implications, but um, I will say that uh, I do make a distinction between the unconscious, which as you rightly observe, has a deep history with Freud, Lacan and so forth, and the non-conscious. And in my book on thought, as you may know, I, uh, I do reference research, uh, recent research that shows there is a level of neuronal processing uh, that is distinct from what Freud thought of as the unconscious and was more correctly called the non-conscious. And the non-conscious um, interprets um, stimuli both from the environment and from within the body, uh, does information processing much faster than consciousness can, and does such essential functions as generate a coherent body image from this input. So the non-conscious performs essential functions that uh, I think uh, are quite distinct from what Freud was talking about with the unconscious manifesting itself through symptoms and dreams and, uh, and so forth. So uh, I just make that distinction about the non-conscious and the unconscious. But then you had a second part to your question and can you just um, maybe uh, briefly uh, recapitulate that for me. Absolutely, and you know, I fundamentally agree with your uh, take on the unconscious and your departure from Freud. And since Freud starts from Aristotle as well and tragedy as a mechanism to identify um, the theory of tragedy for Aristotle is central to psychoanalysis. I was wondering if the, the piece on comedy we don't have. We don't have the section on comedy in the poetics anymore. But I was wondering if your work on science fiction pushes us to think about identification and empathy on, non, on a non-tragic paradigm. 
Well, this is a this is indeed a uh, a huge question, and it touches on something I've been very concerned with uh, recently, which is uh, what we might call the the human aura, a u r a. So, uh, of course, we have Benjamin's seminal essay on the uh, effect on the aura of art, art, artworks in an age of mechanical reproduction. But now we're in an age of uh, deep fakes and what we might call human uh, surrogacy or human copying uh, through uh, computational means. And it, it raises the prospect that the human aura is currently being challenged in a deep sense by various kinds of surrogacies that can pass themselves off as human. I recently read a book uh, called Pharmaco AI, which was presented as a dialogue between the human author and the computer program developed by OpenAI called the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer Number Three. Uh, really an amazing program that you can play with yourself on the internet if, you, if you're so interested. But the purpose of the program is to anticipate from a given input from a human what the next sentences would be. And this human author uses the program to create a dialogue between the human and the machine in which um, if you didn't know the, the various uh, entities through their labeling, you could easily confuse the machine production for the human production. So that's just one example of where uh, computational media now have reached the point where they can imitate a human uh, quite convincingly, even in something as complex as, um, as uh, human speech. So to your question, are there other genres other than uh, tragedy that we might allude to here. I can rephrase that question in, in terms that are, are more easily answered for me. Would it be a tragedy if the human aura were to be subverted by computational media? Is there something sacrosanct about the human aura that uh, we should protect at all, at all costs? And there's a number of recent novels that uh, approach this very question. For example, um, I'm thinking of the recent one by Ishiguru, Clara and the Sun, where that question is approached quite directly. Is it possible to create a robotic substitute for a human being that would be so uncanny that it could in fact, for all practical purposes, duplicate the human aura? Uh, so I, I won't attempt to answer that question. I'll just simply note that I think this is a, um, an emerging controversy within a number of artistic fields. And it, it does uh, raise solidly the question of how one would feel about this erosion of the human aura. Uh, is there something other than a tragic response that we could or should make to this kind of deep, we could call it a deep mimesis? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Bajak, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Professor Hale, thank you for this amazing talk. In fact, this is an amazing opportunity for me and for many others in this room. And I'm going to second Carol saying that uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for, for, if it weren't for your work. So um, I'd like to ask directly, what do you think of the transhumanist endeavors like the Neuralink? So they are part of the new biotechnologies as you might know. Um, in your talk, you've made a clear distinction between correction and enhancement. And with the Neuralink, for instance, I mean, this is just an example of this, uh, but we still don't know its implications. I mean, they say that it's for correction purposes, but we don't know if it's going to be corrective purposes only and if it's going to reach the level of enhancement. And as, ha as Kevin has already pointed out, there's also the social concern related to it. 
I mean, who will access these technologies and et cetera. So I wonder what's your take on this? Thank you. Yeah, well, um, thank, you for, thank you for raising that point. Um, I think none of us would object to using technologies like that to uh, correct deficits. But as I pointed out in my talk, it's not always easy to distinguish between what's a deficit and what's uh, an enhancement. You know, is it a deficit if someone is operating at normal intelligence when through some kind of technological intervention they could be made 30% more intelligent? Well, you know, how, how do you interpret that? Um, but, but for sure, I think that um, these questions of equity that Kevin raised are serious and uh, tend, in my experience with transhumanist discourse, not to be given the serious attention that they really merit. Uh, and in addition to that, when we go to things like gene editing, we really are talking about the possibility of introducing mutations that begin to raise the possibility of a truly post-human species. If you do germline editing in such a way that you're increasing human musculature by 30%, let's say, you're decreasing the need for sleep, you're increasing intelligence and so on and so forth, uh, and you do it so that it can be passed on to all subsequent progeny, you really are in the process of creating a split in the human genome, human germline, between those who have these enhancements and those who don't. And these are not just uh, far-fetched ideas because increasing musculature by 20 to 30 percent has already been done with animals. Uh, uh, biologists know which gene to uh, mess with in order to introduce this, uh, this change. So uh, this is why I think it's so important for the conversations about this, not just to be left to scientists, but to involve humanists and social scientists as well, and certainly ethicists, but legislators and so on. And I I myself in favor, am in favor of strong regulatory frameworks that will um, seek to control this activity to some extent until uh, some kind of consensus has been reached, if that's possible. Thank you very much for that. And uh, it's again, a great opportunity to see that we're on the same page again one more time. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Um, we are over time, but I see there's just one more question. So is that okay with you if we go with it? Sure. Okay, so uh, Nina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I don't want to really hold anyone up from their uh, weekend plans, but uh, thank you so much for this, uh, for this talk. And I'm so happy that you uh, talked about Pharmacon AI because I'm gonna uh, talk about that a bit tomorrow for a little self-promotion. Um, and I think it's just a fascinating project and it kind of resonates with the question I um, often have about responsibility. I think it's such, a, it's such an interesting uh, concept and such an interesting hy hyperfination and just the struggle I always have with it is that it seems to me it is kind of anthropocentric. I can't pronounce this word right now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, I was wondering if, um, if there is a way to think it in a way that includes more species without outsourcing the responsibility of the human basically, because I'm all for humans taking responsibility for for the work but i kind of see an entrance into making excuses for not taking responsibility if we are basically outsourcing or if we're if we're making this a human um 
exceptional for humans. Sorry, I don't know if, if, if my question comes across, but I hope it did. No, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I think you're putting your finger on uh, an important contradiction that I myself have not been able to resolve just in my own terms. And I'll state the contradiction like this. On the one hand, I'm arguing against anthropocentrism. And I think many people at this particular conference are taking that tack. On the other hand, I'm saying that there is something singular about humans in that only humans can take responsibility for the direction that things are going. So how can you have it both ways? How can you say, I, I want to move away from anthropocentrism at the same time that I'm saying humans have a unique ability to take uh, responsibility for what's happening. And this, this points to uh, an undeniable fact, which is that humans have a greater command of symbolic notation and symbolic systems than any other species uh, in existence. And that has given us incredible power over uh, a whole number of different areas, gene editing being uh, just the latest of those. And our power seems to keep growing and growing in that regard. So um, how do you, how do you uh, channel this power in a way that it's not absolutely destructive of the environment and even of a productive future for other humans. And I think that we have to, uh, we can take a clue here from the change in vocabulary that veterinaries are using for animals. They no longer want to talk about you owning a dog or a cat. They want to say that you are the guardians of a dog or a cat, and that um, it's a partnership which involves consent of the animal to participate in that partnership, um, and the animal can withdraw from that partnership. And we've, here in California, we've had several tragic accidents at uh, facilities like SeaWorld, where killer whales have finally gotten fed up with being manipulated by their trainers and they've attacked their trainers. Well, that's an example of an animal withdrawing from a partnership and saying, sorry, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm a lot more powerful than you are. And here, I'm going to show you what I can do. So um, I think that, that we have to start thinking of ourselves more as guardians and, and partners than as owners and uh, controllers. And that kind of rhetoric and that kind of stance seems to me consistent with a move away from anthropocentrism, while at the same time acknowledging that we do as humans have a unique responsibility because we uh, basically, I, I agree with Terence Deacon, because we can enter into a symbolic manipulation. Indeed, thank you. Well, um, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Hales, for being with us tonight. It was a tremendous talk. And if you have a look at the comments, you'll see that everybody's very excited. So I'll, I'll invite you to do so before you leave, because otherwise they will all go away. And uh, I guess uh, the only thing left for us is to uh, thank you all for being here today and to wish you a good night and to see you tomorrow. I would like to just say thank you as well and thank you to all the people who are participating. It is such a fantastic event and uh, we owe a huge great debt of gratitude to the organizers for this. Thank you very much. I think we are in your depth and in the depth of all the participants. This would not have happened uh, without uh, all your participation. So thank you again very much, uh, Catherine Hales. You have a, a long day in front of you. For us, it's a little bit shorter. It's evening. Uh, and I just remind participants that tomorrow we start a little bit earlier at 11, but we'll take you to the museum, to an exhibit titled Wired for Empathy, which I think oh engages with some of the issues that we've been discussing today going beyond anthropocentrism via the arts. So it's going to be a little bit different at 11 tomorrow.
Good night. <laughs>